Mr. Thank Cruz, you. you're doing an amazing job. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, dear ones. I promised our teachers, because we moved the song, the group song, to the end, I promised the teachers that I'm going to make my sermon as brief as possible. <laughs> but that means you need to listen well, amen? I need to preach well, and that means we better pray well. So let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you bless us now as we study from your word. The book of Revelation is an incredible book. It, there's so much to it. It's like, a, it's like a beautiful gem, and as you turn it in the light, there's just so many facets to this incredible book. But I pray, dear Jesus, that the rays of light that will come from the book today, that they will touch the people that have gathered here. There's a reason we're worshiping you today. There's a reason we're here. And if someone is within the sound of my voice, either online or in this place, Lord, I know that you have a message for them. Bless us now. Use me in accordance with your will. Use the folks here. Open their ears, open their hearts, open my mouth. And may the word of God be preached cleanly and clearly. In Christ's name, amen. How many of you parents remember the day your son or daughter was born to you? Can you remember that? How many, do, do, ladies, do you remember how many hours of labor you were in for your children? Tria and I were calculating this morning, and I think we think Tria was in labor for probably about 12 hours um, for hope. And I remember, you know, Tria worked at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami and she worked the day before, she worked the Friday before she gave birth of the Sabbath uh, to Hope. And what's crazy is, so she's, she's working, the, the Sabbath morning we were going to go to church, she said, Ben, I'm not feeling too well, I think we better uh, check, my blood, check my blood pressure. We checked her blood pressure, you know, there's that thing called preeclampsia, remember that? And uh, so we go to, the, go to the hospital, and they're checking her out, and they're saying, guess what, today's the day your baby will be born to you today. And sure enough, some 12 hours later, we went in around 9, and Hope was born to us at 9.20. Now, I can tell you that uh, it doesn't seem fair. I was in the room. Tree is going through this thing. She's working so hard. The, the doctors are coaching her. The nurses are taking care of her. There's needles. There's blood pressure cuffs. I mean, everything is crashing on Tria, right? And it doesn't seem fair. Ladies, does it seem fair that, that you have to push the baby out and the husband just sits there? It doesn't seem fair. It, does, it doesn't seem fair. But so I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, I just keep praying for Tria. I keep praying for the baby, and I'm praying for the team. But I really, there was not much for me to do. And at one point, they, you know, they said, you can't be here. So I was like, I can't be here? All right, well, I left. I went out and bought Tria a gift because I was like, I can't do anything to help her. At least I can buy her something nice. And I came back, and, the, you know, 12 hours felt like an eternity. But when the baby was born... All the attention went from the baby being born to now taking care of the mother who just went through this 12-hour marathon, right? And they wrapped the baby up. They wrapped Hope up, and they put her in this, this little bed made for babies, this little a special hospital bed, and they set her there. They did the APGAR score, and they made sure she was good, and then all attention went back to Mama. And guess what? My baby was there. She couldn't, she couldn't wiggle because she was bound pretty well by those little, cute little blankets they get. And her head was wrapped and actually, no, her head wasn't wrapped yet. They hadn't even got to that point. And her face was covered in blood and, and different things. And I was sitting there. I'd been twiddling my thumbs for 12 hours. And then I said, and the hope starts to cry. And I thought to myself, and no one's paying any attention to her. And I said, who is responsible to take care of that little baby? And then God was like, now's the time. You are responsible. And so I was afraid they were going to kick me out again, so I kind of snuck over to the sink. I got some towels, got it wet, and then I kind of crept over to the baby bed, turned around, trying not to be too noticeable, because everybody's focused on Tria, and I started cleaning the face of our, of our now-born daughter. What an incredible thing. What an incredible thing to see her smile, to see her face, the amount of responsibility. Anybody feel that responsibility? Do you remember that day? Do you remember that overwhelming sense of, I am responsible for this child. Dear ones, come with me to the Word of God. I think that you're going to see something, perhaps something similar in today's study. In Revelation chapter 1, this is our second sermon. Um, it's the third sermon in the series, but really it's the second sermon out of the book of Revelation. And if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, it says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Now, we kind of think of Asia today as more like... Um, uh, China, and, uh, you know, the Far East. This is actually modern-day Turkey, so it's not the Far East. And all seven of the churches are in modern-day Turkey. But the Bible continues, it says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. You know, grace to you and peace. 
A lot of religions today will have a greeting like Shalom or Salam Aleikum. It'll say peace, peace. But it's interesting, only the Christian religion that I'm aware of says grace and peace. Because without God's grace, you can't have peace. Amen? Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Can you think of anybody that who, who always was, who is present, and who will always be? How many of you, as you age as a parent, realize that there's going to come a time, potentially, where your child's going to have to do this life without your watch care? Scary thought, right? But we're only here for a short time. But there is a being, and we're studying, him about, we're studying about him today, who is and who was and is to come. Who is that? Well, you know, it's funny you say Jesus, because that certainly is Jesus. But watch this. Let's read this a little bit further. It says, uh, verse, five, uh, verse 4, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. So it's probably not Jesus. It's got to be God the Father. God the Father. Grace and peace to you from God the Father, the one who is who was and who is to come. And that would fit for Jesus too. But in this case, it's referring to God the Father. And then it says something interesting. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Remember, if we look back in Revelation chapter 1, just, just a couple verses above you, uh, verse, it says, verse 1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. That word communicated in this version, this is the NASB, that's the word that the NKGV uses for signified or signified. The book of Revelation is full of symbols and signs. And so the first, one of the first symbols and signs we're going to deal with today is this symbol and sign, the seven spirits. Now, how many of you um, know your wife's favorite food? How about, your, how about your husband's favorite dessert? How about your best friend's uh, favorite thing to do? Like, like if they had an hour to themselves, you know that's what they're going to be doing, right? You know, as you get to know somebody, you get to know their predilections. I'm going to suggest to you, as we get to know God in the book of Revelation, you're going to quickly discover, let's go ahead and put the uh, PowerPoint on the, the screens. You're going to quickly discover that one of the favorite things, one of the favorite things um, of God, one of the favorite numbers, rather, is the number seven. No, no surprise. If you've ever studied the book of Revelation, you know that it's the number seven is very, very important. And what's interesting about the number seven is that in the Greek New Testament, it occurs 87 different times. That Greek, it's, the, it's the word hepta. It's like 86 of those times it's translated seven. One, the one time it's translated seventh. But what's interesting is in the Greek New Testament, 55 of the times the number seven is found, 55 of the 87, almost twice, almost double the other, the other chapters, the other books, 55 of those occurrences are in the book of Revelation alone. Now... Just for sake of time, I promise the teachers we're going to move through this. Ready for this? For example, there's the seven churches. There's the seven letters. There's the seven spirits, the seven seals, seven stars, seven plagues, seven golden bowls, seven golden lampstands, seven angels, seven eyes, seven final visions, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven, 7,000 people, seven heads, seven crowns, seven hills, seven kings, seven horns. Do you think God's trying to tell us something about the number seven? I think so too. And, you know, if anybody wants this PowerPoint, I'm going to... It's not easy for me to do this because I like to preach without PowerPoints, but I feel like for your sake, I'll make these PowerPoints available to you if you want to use this as your, for studies later. And you don't have to believe anything I say. I will show you the verses and where to find them. And if you have a Bible at home, your Bible is as good as my Bible. You can use it to find the truth. Amen? Okay. And actually, the book of, book of Revelation in general is organized by the following sets of seven. We're going to be studying in the next couple weeks the seven letters to the seven churches, right? That's the first part. But then, then there's the seven seals, which lead into the seven trumpets, which lead into the seven last plagues. And some people even see in the last chapters, of, like chapters 20, 21, and 22, the seven final visions of John. So really, the book, of, the book of Revelation is organized by these series of seven. But for today, we're going to focus on not all of those. Don't worry. That would be a betrayal to our teachers who work so hard. We're only going to focus on this one, the seven spirits. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to Revelation chapter 1. If, if you want to, you can write these down, but I have them on the screen, and you probably can't read those unless you have laser eyes and you have LASIK. 
but I can read them for you, so I'm going to read them for you. Ready? For the first uh, count, the seven spirits of God, the way that we discover what those seven spirits are is we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. The, the, the entire sermon, the last time I preached with you, the goal of that sermon, and I'm sorry if I got distracted, and Lord knows I did, but the goal of that sermon was to compare Scripture with Scripture, amen? So that's what we're going to do. Revelation 1-4 is the first time we discover this. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Well, that's, that's language that's not really used throughout the Bible. So if you're reading the book of Revelation for the first time, this is one of the first times you'll ever come across that phrase, seven spirits who are before his throne. But the next time it occurs is Revelation 3.1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. The next occurrence in Revelation is 4.5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I'm going to tell you a rule of thumb when studying the book of Revelation. Ready for this? If there is a sign in the book of Revelation, there is an explanation for that sign. Either in the book itself or in the book of the Bible as a whole. I'll say it again. God never gives you a sign or a symbol and then doesn't bother you to explain what it is. Right? What would, what would the point of that be? So if he gives you, if he takes the time to give you a sign or a symbol, he'll also take the time to give you the explanation, but it just takes a little study. So one of the first definitions is it's the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Revelation 5, 6 says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns, <clears throat> pardon me, seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. So if we were to take all these together, these descriptions, this is what we would get. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is what we would get. And I'm going to ask my bride, will you give me another bottle of water? Thank you. Um, Revel Here it goes. This is the list. Seven different things. The seven spirits of God, grace and peace come from it, right? Exist in the throne room of heaven. The seven spirits of God, Jesus possesses them, uh, according to Revelation so far. It's symbolized by the seven lamp candlestick in the midst or the center of the throne room. By the way, who's in the midst of a throne? Who, well, I mean, more, more kind of like in a, in a monarchy. Who sits on the throne? The king, right? And on a monarchy, just an earthly monarchy. The king sits on the throne, right? And so if, if I were to run up and sit on the throne, say the throne of England, if there is such a thing, if, if I could sit on that throne, would, do I belong there? No, someone, I'm sure some royal guard would kick me out and I'd be on a list I'd never be able to come back, right? So my point is, the, uh, if this being is in the midst, of the seven spirits are in the midst of the center of the throne, then maybe, just maybe, this spirit has something to do with God. Represented by perfect, complete power. Let's think about the number seven real quick, just biblically speaking. How many days are there in a week? Right? How many of you look forward to the weekend? <laughs> Amen, Right? You get you, your Monday, your Tuesday, you go Monday through Friday, and you can't wait, right, for the weekend. Well, when God created the earth initially, according to the book of Genesis, God created for six days, and on the seventh day, he rested and sanctified it. Does that make sense? So the seventh is, is associated with, the, seven, the number seven is associated with completeness or, or finishing. It's like, a, it's like a complete. If, you have a, if you're dealing with all seven, then you're dealing with a complete package according to the Bible. So <clears throat> complete power, perfect power, perfect knowledge, complete. And then this seven is sent into all the earth. Now, brothers and sisters, how many of you believe that, the, um, that if it's true in the book of Revelation, it should be true, say, in the book of Genesis? Do you believe that the same spirit inspired the, the Bible writer in Moses in, in this case? Yeah. Do you believe that same spirit was there to inspire John and Isla Patmos? I do too. So let's go to a couple of these. And for sake of time, we're not going to look at all of them. But I want to go to a couple of them for you. For example, grace and peace come from it. I'm going to suggest to you that I think that the seven spirits of God is Revelation's way of introducing you to the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Not seven different spirits, but the Holy Spirit. It's just the way the book of Revelation describes the Holy Spirit. Now, you might say, Pastor, how do you say that? Well, these are the identifying marks for the seven spirits of God. Does the Holy Spirit meet these requirements? Well, let's go to Galatians 5.22. I have it here in my Bible. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The grace and peace come from the seven spirits. Remember, it says grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne of God. Well, does, according to this verse, does peace come from the spirit? Amen. And do we, do we deserve peace? Well, <laughs> the Bible says the wages of sin is death, right? I'm personally a sinner. I don't know. I'm not going you know, to judge you, but I don't deserve peace, and that's why God gives me grace. Amen? Grace is when you deserve one thing and you get another. I don't deserve peace, but God in his mercy gives it to me. Amen? And the Holy Spirit, one of the gifts of the Spirit is peace. So that makes sense. Let's look at this next one. Jesus possesses the seven spirits of God. Well, let's take a look at that verse right there, Luke 4, 1. Does Jesus possess the Holy Spirit? Does the Bible clearly teach this? Ready for this? Luke 4, 1 says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. So according to the Bible and Revelation, the seven spirits, um, it's Jesus possesses these seven spirits. We find that throughout the book of Revelation. And back here in Luke, what is Jesus full of? He's full of the Holy Spirit. So, so far it makes sense. The seven spirits is Revelation's way of describing the Holy Spirit. Let's look at one more example. And we're not going to look at the second example there for sake of time. But well, we're going to look into the last one, sent into all the earth. Is the Holy Spirit sent into all the earth? Well, there's a lot of verses for this, I'm sure. But the one we're going to look at is Joel. <clears throat> Joel chapter 2. And I think this verse is particularly important for kids that go to PCAS. Ready for this? Listen to this. Joel 2, 28. It says, It will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on what? All flesh, all mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. You know what's amazing? Not so long ago, there was a... There was... Remember, Hope was born, you know, back in Miami. She's now, I believe, Hope years is eight Eight years old, eight years later, Hope was standing right where I'm standing today, and PCS was here for a, a chapel, and Hope was preaching the Word of God. Pretty awesome, pretty awesome in my opinion, that Hope was, felt comfortable enough to share the Word of God in front of her peers. And the Bible says, I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Do you want the Holy Spirit poured out on your kids? I want the Holy Spirit poured out on my kids. And that's the point of PCAS, is to put your kids in the best possible place for them to hear from God. Amen? That is our goal. Dear ones, I want to take you to one more passage. Actually, let's, uh, you don't have to believe me. Believe the Bible. I will provide you with this, this, this uh, PowerPoint, and you can further study on, on your own. But I'm going to suggest to you, and I believe it's, it's true based on what we've studied, I believe that the seven spirits of God is equal to the Holy Spirit. So if we understand that, when we come to Revelation chapter 1, we come back to that, listen to how the Bible reads if, if we identify everything accordingly. Revelation chapter 1, it now reads, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace to you from God the Father, God the Spirit, and from who? Jesus Christ. Now I got a question for you. Who was here when the world began? According to the Bible, who was there when the earth was born? Who took responsibility for this thing called planet earth and all the life that was on it? Now, when, when I was in the, the, uh, the labor and delivery room and Tria had just given birth to our daughter, and I walked over and I was cleaning her face and I held her for the first time and no one told me to drop, I mean, I would never drop her. No one told me, what are you doing? No, I was responsible for her, Amen. And God is responsible for us. God is responsible for this creation. God is responsible. And we can find in Genesis 1, we can find that, and the Lord God, you know, the, 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 the Lord God spoke, the Spirit of the waters, or the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, and the Lord God spoke, let there be light. There is all, 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 all entities are there. God the Father, the Spirit, and the Word. Let there be light. And that same trio, that same holy trinity that we find throughout the Bible, we find it in the, the baptism of Jesus, we find it now in the chapter 1 of Revelation. And we learn that God is still responsible. He still takes responsibility for this thing called planet Earth. And consider this. The Bible says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and releases us from our sins, 
by his blood, amen, who loved us. And the Bible says, other versions say, washed us. When I was washing Hope's face that day because I took responsibility, that's what Jesus is doing for us. He's taking responsibility and he's washing us from the sins of this earth and he's cleaning us, but not with water, with something far more precious, by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. Brothers and sisters, I don't always feel like I'm part of the kingdom. Sometimes I feel like I don't belong, amen? Sometimes I don't feel like I, I, I deserve that kind of title or I should, I should be serving in that capacity, but that doesn't prevent God from using us, amen? That doesn't get, prevent God from, from raising you up, and you may not feel like you belong, like, like you are of the caliber of person that should be doing this or should be doing that. That doesn't matter. God is the one who chooses, amen? And God knows what he's doing, and he's going to make you into a kingdom of priests to his God and to his Father, those are servants of God who serve in the family of God. To him be the glory, dominion forever and ever. And look at verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Obviously, that's referring to either the second coming, uh, the, the uh, parousia, the, the anticipation, the event that we're all hoping that Jesus comes soon. Amen. We hope Jesus comes soon. He, uh, sin has no, sin comes to an end when Jesus comes. He's going to hold sin and the origin, origin of sin, Satan accountable. But what's interesting in verse 8, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. And Danny and teachers, here it goes. This is the end of the sermon. Ready for this? Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, Alpha and Omega, you, if you don't speak Greek, you may not know, you probably do, that Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. But we kind of recognize it more from the A to Z. So let's go to the next. Amazon, right? The Amazon logo. You ever notice that little arrow? It goes from A to Z. What is Amazon suggesting to you? We got what you want. We got everything you need from A to Z. Where did they get that from? I think they got that from whether they realize it or not. They get it from God saying, uh, Jesus saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Brothers and sisters, if it's true in Revelation, it's true elsewhere. Look at Philippians 1.6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work, the beginning, began a good work in you, will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ, or in this case, Christ Jesus. Amen? The one who began the world is taking responsibility for its salvation. The one who began the world has written a book to let you know how things are going to be wrapped up and how he's going to take responsibility and bring an end to the things that are hurting your and my family. Amen? And how he's going to save everyone who comes to him. The Bible says in John 6, if any man comes unto me, I will in what? No wise cast him out. If anyone says, calls upon the name of the Lord, the same shall be saved. Jesus is saying, he's able to begin a good work in you. And if, he, if you let him begin the good work, he will do what it takes to make you perfect and complete. The number seven, right? In your life, in time, for his return. That gives me great comfort. I don't know about you because I am a mess. Anyone else a mess? I, if one cookie's good, 10 cookies are better. You know, I'm a mess. But you know, but here's the good news. God started something in me when I turned 11 years old. I gave my life to Christ's kids and I was baptized. And God has not given up on me through the ups and downs. He was there at the letter J. He was there at the elemental P. He was there at the, at the, if there was a low point, he's there at the high point, and he'll be there at the finish line. If there's a message from this first prologue in Revelation 1, 4 through 8, the message is this. If you let God start a journey with you, he will complete it in time for his return. Is there kids? I wonder, you know, you made a decision this week on Wednesday you said, I want to start my journey with Jesus. Is anyone willing of this PCS student body, raise your hand if you were among the group that said, I want to start my journey with Jesus. If you start that journey with Jesus, he will help you. He will do it. Who, who does it? I have yet to fix myself, but I am God's problem. Amen? And he's taking responsibility for me. And if you let him, he'll take responsibility for you. Dear ones, is there anybody else in the church family who wants to say, you know what? I like the book of Revelation. I like this verse. I want God to be my Alpha and Omega. I want him, you know, the grace and peace to you, Alpha and Omega, it's wall-to-wall -wall grace. Grace, 
That's back on the cross, right? That's back when you accept Jesus. Why is it here in the book of Revelation? Because you will never outgrow your need of grace. It's wall-to-wall grace. Would you want a house that has only half the rooms with carpet? You want wall-to-wall flooring, right? God knows what it takes. He gives you wall-to-wall grace. Alpha and the Omega. You know, I want to be there for my kids. I know you want to be there for yours. And if you have grandkids, you want to be there for your grandkids. But the reality is, in this life, the best I can do is introduce them to the Alpha and the Omega. Because I might only get a journey with them from the Alpha to, who knows, maybe M, N, O, P, Q. I might not make it to the end, but there's one who will, who started with them and has the power to finish with them. Let's close our eyes and talk to our God. Loving Heavenly Father, in this church today, we're so grateful for the church family. We're so grateful for the school family. And we recognize today in the book of Revelation, just the very first couple verses, you want to be our Alpha and Omega. You want to you begin a good work, and you promise to complete that. Lord, I take you at your word, and with all my faults and failures, hurts and hang-ups, Lord, I'm not my problem, I'm your problem. And I surrender my life into your hands. Make beautiful what Satan has made ugly. Make strong what this life has made weak. And if you'll do that for me, I know you'll do that for everyone in this room. If there's a marriage that needs strengthening, if there's a body that needs strengthening, if there's, there's some sort of illness someone's fighting, if, if there's financial situations, if there's whatever it is, Lord, that, that is compromising and harming these families, Lord, I pray that they'd find what I've found. You can be the Alpha and the Omega. You are the Alpha and the Omega. And when we say yes to you, you take us right where we're at and you complete what needs to be done. I love you, Lord. I trust you. And I want to see all these families in your kingdom soon and very soon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.